this video is the third video in the section of population studies and it talks about social organization. We're especially going to look at the importance of herds, of packs, and um, the term eusocial and how that would relate to termites specifically. So pretty much all animals have some sort of social organization. Very few animals live in a completely solitary way. Many animals live in groups or colonies that show social organization for all or just for parts of their lives. Social organization is just the structure of relationships within a group. To be socially organized, there must be certain features present among the group. These include resources, so food, territory and nest sites, and activities, things like protection and other skills. It doesn't have to be these specific resources or these specific activities, but there has to be some sort of resources and activities involved in the um, social organization of the group. What is the value? What is the importance of social organization? Well, the two groups that have developed proper social organization to a particular high degree are insects, things like termites and bees, and mammals like wild dogs and naked mole rats. Social organization is very valuable because it improves the survival and reproductive success of an individual. And in the end, this is all that's really important in an individual's life. Obviously, people are kind of a whole separate label from that. But when we look at animals and um, even at plants, the main goal of their life is to reproduce individuals, continue the population, and in doing so, they need to survive to sexual maturity. Social organization makes it easier to avoid being attacked by predators, to find food by hunting collectively, to divide labor among individuals, to find mates, to protect their resources, and to regulate the population size, prevented from getting too large or too small. Um, we can first look at herds or flocks as a predator avoidance strategy, so to try and protect and avoid predators, protect each other and avoid predators. The biggest advantage of forming a large group which we call flocking, is that the safety of the group is increased by avoiding and defending against predators. Although a predator can see a large group more easily, they are probably less prey captured overall because of the following things. Now, just to note, I spoke about it in the first population studies video, where I spoke about how, um, the pred how predation is a density dependent factor, which means that um, predators are more likely to spot large groups of animals than small groups of animals or just individuals. However, even though predators are more likely to see this large group, each individual in the group is actually better protected because of the following. With many eyes and ears, the group as a whole is more watchful and especially the group can um, spot the animals, more, the predators more quickly, especially the individuals on the edge of the group. If there's a large herd or flock, the, um, they can mob the predator so they can surround and over the, overpower the predator. This is often seen in birds where things like um, starlings will mob a raptor and fly at it and keep trying to surround and overpower it to protect the individuals. There also the greater number of individuals in the group means that there's greater survival chances are for each individual itself. This is called the dilution effect. So this makes sense if there's a group of 10 impala when a lion chases it, each impala has a 1 in 10 chance of being the one that's caught. If there's a group of 100 impala, each impala only has a 1 in 100 chance of getting caught. That's the dilution effect. It's also helpful to be in a herd because as the predator tries to single out its prey, the herd scatters in all directions and confuses the predator. This is called the confusion and distraction effect, and this is especially um, noticeable in zebras. It also, the members of the flock can protect those who are molting or those who are vulnerable against predators. This would happen in penguins, but also in a number of different species, like an elephant or buffalo. You'll often see the young and the weak individuals in the middle of the herd, protected by um, the stronger individuals around them. And also during migration, the inexperienced are given guidance and protection by the herd or the flock, by the more experienced individuals, to protect, to protect them against predation. Um, zebras, as I said, exhibit many of those strategies, which ensures their survival. But in addition, the vertical stripes of zebra cause individual zebras in a herd to actually blend together when viewed from a distance. So to the predator, the large shape is not actually recognized as a potential source of food because the predator can't um, individualize one specific um, individual. It just sees a whole big 
huge um, shape that it can't see as individual zebras. If we then look at packs, packs we're going to look at in terms of hunting and how it makes hunting more successful. The African wild dogs are a really good example of this. Um, so we're going to look at packs, especially in terms of wild dogs. In tests, they may not ask it specifically in terms of wild dogs, and, but you can use this knowledge to relate it to any animals. But I've often seen in past tests that they do actually use wild dogs, zebras, and termites, which I'll talk about later. So African wild dogs are highly social animals. They have very complex methods of communication that keep the group functioning together, especially when they're hunting. They're slim, long-legged animals about the size of an Alsatian dog. And they have mottled coats, tan, black, and white colored, with each individual actually having a unique pattern. Uh, information like this isn't really necessary. They aren't going to test you on this, but it's just good background information to know. Um, the African dog differs from the true, true dogs and wolves because it only has four, not five toes in each feet. And its round ears are very large and round and their characteristic result in a large, um, sharp sense of hearing. Because they're so big and round, they can catch um, a lot of sound into their ears. In South Africa, most wild dogs are found in the Kruger and the Shushlui and Pelosi Park and in Shemwari. In the Bushman land region of Namibia, there are also some free roaming packs. There are obviously wild dogs in other parts of the country, things like Medique, um, uh, Maremi, the Delta in Botswana, Mana Pools, that sort of thing. But these are some of the main regions. Again, this information is not really vital to know. This is the more important information. The African wild dogs have one of the highest success rates of any predator species in Africa, about an 80% success rate. They hunt in very closely knit packs of closely knit packs of up to 15 individuals. Um, they catch prey such as antelope, zebra, and warthog. When they detect their prey, they can do it by sight or by sound. They'll chase it at a fast run, usually about 45 kilometers an hour. That's fast. Um, and that's especially fast because they can chase it for so long for an hour or more, they have a lot of stamina and they can cover many kilometers. When the prey tires, they immobilize it. One dog will, do, will grab its tail, the other will grab its upper lip and the rest of the pack kills the prey very quickly and efficiently. The whole pack shares in the kill and one of the unusual things about it is that the young feed first. Wild dogs are the only carnivorous species in which this happens. Usually the dominant um, pair, the alpha pair or the males or something will eat first. If the wild dog's left behind in the den, um, usually this would be the dominant female and, its pu and her pups, or, or dogs that aren't able to hunt, the sick, the injured, and the very old. They will be fed um, regurgitated meat. So the dogs that have eaten will um, bring up, will throw up partially digested meat. Um, in this very efficient system of hunting, the, the needs of the whole pack are met and the survival of the species is ensured. Um, Wild dogs are animals with a dominant breeding pair. They're obviously not the only animals. Um, there's a strict ranking system within the pack of African wild dogs, led by the dominant alpha female and alpha male. They mate for life, and this prevents other females from breeding. They are therefore the only members of the pack that breed. What happens to the offspring? The females reach sexual maturity at, um, I don't know how many months that's supposed to be, to two years at which point they leave to join a new pack. So the females will leave the pack. The males will remain with their pack for the rest of their lives, and they usually live for about 11 years. Um, what are the benefits of this type of social organization? So of having a dominant breeding pair. The dominant pair keeps the pack under control, um, allows the pack to operate as a highly successful unit, ensuring the survival of the species. Raising the pups of the dominant breeding pair and caring for the old or sick individuals is a group task. So pretty much all the members um, play a role in this task. Subordinate members, so members that aren't the alpha male or female, they also benefit because they have access to shared resources. And later in their lives, they may become dominant as well if something happened to the alpha male or the alpha female. Um, then the last thing we're gonna look at is the division of tasks among castes. Um, so castes are a group, each group has a specific task. Most animals that live in social groups have division of tasks or labor within the group. These would be animals like termites, bees, wasps, naked mole rats, etc. Each individual in the group has a specific role to play that is important for the success of the group as a whole. You social animals 
are the most advanced term form of social organization. These animals live in colonies in which there's a dominant breeding pair, or there could be a single female, the queen, and the animals that aren't breeding have different tasks to perform. So there would be a strict caste system. Some of the tasks would be collecting food, caring for the young, building, maintaining, and protecting the nest. Because of environmental pressures, such as the shortage of research, uh, sorry, resources, individuals of such colonies couldn't survive on their own. They need the colony to survive. Eusociality is a major evolutionary innovation which has evolved the changes in life history, structure, and behavior. Termites and ants are all eusocial, as are some species of bee and wasp and some are mammals, such as naked mole rats. Very few mammals are actually eusocial. And as I said, eusocial species are species that exhibit the highest level of social organization. So if we look at um, the division of tasks among castes, especially with reference to termites, termites are cellulose eating insects. They live in a colony that's highly organized integrated unit. African and Australian termites create large mounds of soil, such as this one pictured here. They cemented with feces and saliva called termitaria. They have a very strict caste system. This includes firstly reproductives. Within the reproductive castes, we have the alates. Each termite colony is founded by two winged termites called the alates. These winged termites appear in the rainy season, they mate, and they can found a new colony, so uh, establish a new colony. The re in the reproductives, there's also the queen and king. After losing their wings, the pair bur burrow underground, so the alates bur burrow underground. The female becomes the queen and the male the king of this new colony. The eggs that the queen continuously lays hatch into nymphs, and these young termites will grow into other castes that have different roles in the colony that we'll explore in the next few slides. The queen lays thousands of eggs each week, and her egg-filled abdomen can extend up to 10 centimeters in some species. That's huge for termites. Unlike bees, wasps, and ants, the king does actually play a continuous role by mating with the queen at regular intervals. Within the reproductive, there's also young reproductives. These are the young termites that will either the, become the new alates, so the new kings or queens of a new colony, or they'll become supplementary reproductives that are just there to replace the king and the queen if they should die. In the other um, uh, divisions of the task, so in the other caste system, there could be workers. Um, most of the termites in the colony are workers. This is the main um, caste. Unlike ants, bees, and wasps, Termite workers can be male or female. They make tunnels, they build the termite mount, they look for food, they protect the eggs and nymphs, and they feed the other members of the colony. They can digest the cellulose in leaves and in wood by using specific bacteria and protozoa in their stomachs. And they then pass the partially digested food to the king and the queen, the nymphs and the soldiers. So either regurgitated or as fecal pellets. So the other termites don't actually have this bacteria and protozoa in their stomachs, but they eat the regurgitated or partially digested food um, from the worker termites. The third role or the third caste is soldiers. There's about 5% of um, the termites are soldiers and they have huge biting or squirting mouth parts, uh, depending on the species of termite, which helps with the defense of the colony, especially defending it from ants. So you can see that these would be some of the different um, termites from different castes. So the queen, the young reproductive, which is winged. There's a soldier. You can see that biting, biting mouth part. There's a worker ant and the king. Um, they could give you a, a diagram like this with the labels wrapped out and actually ask you to label um, each uh, type of termite or describe its role. How is the ratio of the caste regulated? So how do we regulate that 5% become soldiers, some become workers, some become young, reproductive, etc.? So we know that usually there's a king and a queen and a set ratio of soldiers to workers and nymphs. All nymphs are genetically identical at hatching. We know that because there's one king and queen um, and it um, must be sexual, um, asexual reproduction. And um, all um, could develop into any of the three major castes. If individuals of one specific caste are lost, additional members of that caste can develop from the nymphs to, to restore the balance because there has to be the set ratio. If there's an overproduction of a caste, there's actually selective cannibalism that will restore the balance. 
both reproductive and soldier casts secrete a pheromone, um, a chemical message that is transmitted through food sharing and through grooming to other members of the colony, which inhibits the development of reproductives or soldiers. So it prevents too many um, termites becoming reproductives or soldiers, it, which means that they are workers. If the caste balance of the colony is upset, some undifferentiated nymphs don't receive this pheromone message, obviously because there's not enough reproductives or soldiers to give out the pheromone message. And because of this, the um, undifferentiated, undifferentiated nymphs will actually develop into reproductives or into soldiers, thereby restoring the balance. Um, so that's the um, social organization part of uh, population studies. The last section, which I'll explore in a later video, is human um, populations. But it's just important to know not, you don't need to know specific examples, um, specific information about the animals itself, such as the things I told you about wild dogs, is not that important. But you need to know why it's important to work in uh, packs to hunt, to have a dominant breeding pair. Both of those examples I mostly spoke about with reference to wild dogs but it's good to know how to relate them to other species. Um, if you look at past papers, there's often quite a lot of examples that will um, ask you about this um, sort of section about castes, about dominant breeding pairs and herds and uh, packs and that sort of thing. Have a look, because they often give really good answers in their memo that you can use. Um, they'll say like, give six examples of why it's important to work in a pack and then if you know it's fantastic if you don't have a look at the memo and that those will give you an idea of um, how you should be answering it <laughs>